Hello and welcome back to part two of implementing table-based CRC's logic in Verilog. In this presentation, we will go over serial implementation of CRC, how the solution for CRC looks, and the ideas of mirroring data bytes, and how the final value of CRC is computed. Then we go on showing you one of the ideas from the previous presentation, which is CRC seen as a sum of parts breaking that down so that we can do a parallel compute instead of the serial compute that is normally done and it's a slower compute if you do it serially so we break that down into sum of parts finally we end this presentation with an idea about how to produce these tables which we can later on just store in a rom or some lookup inside the uh, verilog or fpga code so Without further ado, let's dive into the first part. The serial CRC implementation is where we start and we have to understand how this is constructed before we can build upon the idea of CRC. So first off, you can see that CRC has a polynomial, which in this case uh, is a common 32-bit CRC polynomial. You can get it off Wikipedia. But once you have this polynomial, we initialize the CRC um, register with some fixed value in this case. Conventionally, it is all Fs. Then you feed in your data message bytes through this XOR mesh. And what happens is that the data is always fed in a mirrored fashion, or I call it reverse function here, which you see right there. The reverse function basically inverts the bit pattern, so the MSB becomes the LSB and vice versa. This is primarily because data in back in the day was supposed to be serialized. When there was serial data, it was always sent the lowest bit first. And therefore, it conventionally, we have to reverse the data as it goes through the CRC compute. And then once we have done that, the data byte is, each byte is reversed and then fed into this CRC algorithm. We compute the CRC by running through this algorithm here, we go through each bit of that byte. And then we run by XORing through this polynomial, which is, which is mentioned up here, this polynomial. And we keep running through this polynomial till all the bits are exhausted. So it's a very simple formula that you can um, take the CRC equation and compute how you know you feed it's almost like feeding paper into the shredder it takes your message and then it keeps XORing the message through the CRC and XORing the polynomial every time the MSB is one it keeps XORing this polynomial and you get the answer at the end and then when we get the answer at the end we basically invert all the bits by XORing with all Fs, and then we reverse the order again. And it's almost a mirror function of all the bits, all 32 bits of CRC are mirrored again, and then we get the final answer which is returned. So this is the serial implementation of CRC. Now let's look into the other idea of how CRC can be seen as sum of parts. In the previous slide what we saw was that CRC at any point we were computing byte wise but in this case let's say we are computing four bytes at a time which is 32 bits here and CRC uh, let's say itself was 32 bits actually let's let's say four 32 bit words <clears throat> which is 128 bits so d3 is 32 bits d2 is 32 bits d1 is 32 bits and d0 is 32 bits so overall this is a 128 bit word and crc itself was 32 bit word now we can see this in the in the following form you can see crc itself at any point the state of the crc as crc which is 32 bits followed by three 32 bit words which were just zeros okay we're going to run this through the CRC polynomial, what we saw in the previous slide. And you can see D3, D2, D1, and D0 also as D3 followed by all zeros, D2 followed by two zeros, D1 followed by one word of zero, and D0 followed by none. 
The key idea here is that instead of computing this word, which is a serial implementation, D3 before D2, before D1, before D0, we could have computed all of this in parallel. If we knew just what the equation for computing CRC followed by three zeros or any data byte followed by any number of zeros, if we knew how to compute this, we could just compute this. We could compute this in parallel. We could compute this in parallel. We could compute this in parallel and then eventually XOR all of these outputs, all these table lookups and produce the final solution. The other optimization here that we could make is that it's easy to make 8-bit tables because otherwise the tables get pretty deep. If you have, let's say, 32-bit data, you need 2 to the power of 32 rows in that lookup table, and that's a very deep table. So normally, you will make either 8-bit or 16-bit lookup tables. In this case, we choose to make an 8-bit table, which means that we would basically look up in this table for every 8 bit and we would know how many bit how many zeros are how many zero bytes are following it and if if let's say this were bytes and d0 was a byte and d1 was a byte and d2 was a byte and d3 was a byte we would basically evolve this uh, as saying d3 is followed by three zeros three bytes of zeros. D2 is followed by two bytes of zeros. D1 is followed by one byte of zero and D0 is followed by zero bytes of zeros. So this idea is very important for the next stage of calculation, which is CRC instead of being serial up on top here is seen as parallel, which is each of these compute by breaking this down into words or words into bytes we can just assume that every byte in itself is followed by so many zeros and we can just compute that in its own independent compute table lookup and then once we have done all these parallel lookups we XOR all the results together and get the final CRC. Now you should also remember that there is at the end there is this other step of taking the final output inverting it and putting the bit order in the reverse and then shipping it out so we will for now ignore all that so all that we're talking about is all this computation is essentially up here when you're running through this equation this compute can be solved by this optimization that we can compute with any word followed by a certain number of zeros based on its position and then XOR the final result. Now let's go over to how do we produce these tables. Here's how. In my example here I assume that we have a 32 byte word which means that any byte at the most can be followed by 31 zeros. So if it was fully populated 32 byte word, there'd be 31, there'd be a byte followed by 31 zeros, a byte followed by 30 zeros, and then the final byte, the MSP would be followed by nothing. So it's just by itself. And so we produce a table structure here, which is table I followed by a J. So it's a two dimensional matrix. And in this, basically I'm assuming that the I is how many zeros are following and then inside it, the J is just 8-bit word. So the J is just a lookup of any word, and this I is how many zeros are following. And by putting these two loops, I can now run through the equation two times. So first time is I run the byte, and in this case, I'm not mirroring it, but you could also compute by just reversing the bits. And I'll show you later on why I do this. But the other thing to note is that in this case, the CRC starting point for each compute is always zero. So you can see that I start, instead of start starting CRC with Fs, I start with CRC of zero. And I'll cover that in a little bit. First, let me go through what the equations are for data computation, and then I'll show you why I didn't start with CRC of all Fs. So 
Here we take this byte and we run through the byte first. We go through all the bits of that byte. Now we assume that it's followed by a number of zeros. And we go through all those zeros. We go through all those zeros and we pass them just like data. So the whole word looks like a byte followed by any number of zeros. We compute all this result and we store it in a table where the I was how many zeros were there and for every byte like 0 to 255 I would make a J of that and store that as CRC. So now once I've computed these memoization tables I now have an ability to look up any byte and see what its impact on the final CRC would be, what its, its contribution to that CRC for that word would be. Now I have gone to the next level where I can compute any byte and what its final component in this XOR of all these parallel functions would be. So once again, this idea of computing every byte and CRC is no different. CRC is also just a byte and that equation is run on the CRC also except that CRC is run straight whereas data bits are mirrored or reversed in order every byte is reversed before it's it's sent into that equation so these tables therefore can be applied to the CRC as well as the data bytes now previously I said there is a reason why this CRC is zero here that is because what we do is in any clock cycle, we treat the CRC itself as a byte or as a, as a, as a uh, input function. And then if you remove the value of the state of CRC, whether in the beginning it was all Fs, at any clock cycle it is CRC from the previous cycle. If you think of this as another byte which is aligned with the very first, with the MSB word, then it's just another compute. We compute the CRC through this and that becomes another function of the XOR. We compute this word, we XOR with this, this word, then this word, then this word, and then this word. So this D0, D100, D2000, D30. So all this XOR basically is what it ends up being. Now coming back to this, why we not make it Fs? Because zero is where there is no CRC state. Zero assumes that this word is by itself. If, the, if we put it to any other value, it has some memory of the previous state. And that's why we don't start with Fs. We don't start with anything. That means we are looking in isolation. We are looking in isolation and we are looking at just D3 by itself, just D2 by itself, just D1 by itself. It has no state, no memory from before, no FFs, no C. There is no previous state. So that's why when we make these memoization tables, we start with CRC of zero. So now that you have understood this, I think we are ready to dive into the next level which where we would describe how we can put all this together. And then the final function will explain to you how we can run all of the data through these tables that we have constructed. And then we would be able to finally put together the CRC. Now, in the previous presentation, we described how the last clock cycle is a little bit complicated. So we will break down the next presentation into two parts where we see how every byte from the beginning of the packet all the way down to the last clock cycle. And for those who are you know, not familiar with Verilog and FPGA and clock cycles, it may be a little bit difficult to understand this. But for the FPGA, we break down all the packet data into chunks of, let's say, 32 byte data, 256 bits of data. And there'd be many such clock cycles, many such beats in which data is broken down. The very first beat, also called sometimes start a packet, and the last one maybe end a packet. And the packet itself may be 1500 bytes or 600 bytes or whatever you have. So that's the idea here and uh, we will cover that in the next uh, presentation so hope you enjoyed this and um, stay tuned for more hope to see you soon bye bye